Hello. You are listening to One Voice Makes a Difference, a place where people can tell their stories of how God's voice made a difference in their life. We pray you will be inspired and encouraged by today's episode. Now, here's your host, Janet Swanson. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to One Voice Makes a Difference podcast. I'm so glad that you have joined us today because I have a treat for you. Actually, I don't. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has something for you today. And I just want to ask you right now just to begin to open your heart to receive what the Lord has for you. Some of you have started listening or maybe you're seeing this podcast and you're you're hungry and your your heart has been heavy and you've been in a lot of spiritual warfare. But today God wants to speak to you and he's going to use testimonies to do that to speak to your heart. Today I have Tony Maisie. Did I say it right? Maisie. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Maisie. He is all the way from England, you guys, Kent, England. And I have heard of his story just listening to him on other podcasts. And he was so gracious to be a guest here on One Voice Makes a Difference podcast today. So, Tony, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Janet. It's a blessing to be on your podcast and uh, can really feel the Lord with us, Holy Spirit with us. Amen. Man, I have been feeling his presence all morning. Just I got up with just feeling his presence all over me. And I know that God wants to speak to people through this podcast today. So you guys just tune your ear in. Just listen to what the Lord is saying, because I believe you are going to be blessed by this testimony. Remember, the word of God says in Revelation 12, that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And we don't love ourselves to death. I know we're in a world where uh, everybody's like, oh, just love yourself to death. No, you got to give. There's things that you give up when you follow Christ. And I'm seeing that even, you know, just teaching the youth and a lot of things that I'm doing now and going out and evangelism and speaking the gospel. People are so in love with themselves that they don't want to give up themselves to come to Christ. They want to bring all of their stuff in. Hey, bring all your stuff in. I want you to bring your stuff in and give it to the Lord and make that great exchange with him because he's the only one. You guys, he is the only one that can do it and take away all of the pain in your life, heal you, set you free, deliver you. And I'm telling you, Tony Mazzi, his testimony is... It's like living proof of what God can do in a person's life. So I just want to get straight to it because I am so inspired by your testimony. I am so inspired by what God has done. It's really just set me on fire knowing what God has done in your life. So Tony, I want to ask you this first question. Um, You know, I believe that in our childhood, the things that happen to us, whether you've been traumatized or sexually abused for me, there was a lot of sexual abuse and abandonment in my life. And it opened doors for the enemy to wreak havoc in my life and take me down a road that I never thought I would go down. And, and I believe that in, in our childhood, we're so tender in that time, you know, we, uh, the Lord can mold our hearts, but the enemy can pierce our heart and and create so much pain that it opens doors for the enemy to wreak havoc and to just have control in our life. So I, I want to get down to the root of your testimony. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and where those doors were open that led you to the life that you were living? Sure. Okay, Johnny. Well, in my book, the first uh, in the in the, the very beginning, I talk about the earliest memory that I had was when I was about four or five, and I remember a, um, a priestly figure coming to, to my grandparents' home, and there was a loud knock at the door, and he came into the hall, and I remember him walking around, and he was um, obviously would have been speaking words from the Bible and so on, 
and it turned out that he said that there was an evil spirit in the home mm. now he left that day but what my grandparents had failed to mention to him was that they was involved uh, with the occult now they probably wouldn't have even called it that but they used to do uh, you know these uh, these seances and so on uh, and they would do the ouija board and things like this sometimes they would just bring people back from from the pub you know and i think there was certainly in the U in england there was a kind of thing back in the i, I don't know when it started well obviously it's always happened you know witchcraft has always been around but i think there was an innocence to it that they didn't actually realize what they was opening themselves up to right now they used to move from home to home they went so many different places that they lived in homes and they would buy and sell homes and then they would say oh there's a presence in the home or there's a it's unlucky or something like that. And they knew it never dawned on them that they was op opening themselves up to evil. And so my earliest memory is about that age. And I remember, and the reason I remember that, I believe I was meant to remember it. I was always, now I realize I was always very uh, kind of close to the, to, to the demonic really, or I wouldn't have even called it that. But I was, I remember sensing a spirit in the hall, a darkness, it was like a void. And I remember being able to kind of, not literally look into it, but I just sensed this, it was like, it was never ending. It was almost like a black hole type of thing I could see in the spirit realm. And it was, it was horrible. And so I remember sensing that when I went to my grandparents. And then after that, when my, my own parents moved to a home when I was about seven, a new home, um, there was, again, this home, there was just a presence in the whole of the house, but it seemed to be in my bedroom a lot, and also down in the hall and near, well, every room really, but especially up the staircase. And um, it was only later on that my sister actually said, well, since we've had discussions about it, that she used to sense it as well. Now, there was there my grandparents would come and stay there sometimes again they would do the ouija board and things like this they would read tea leaves and tar uh, palm reading and stuff like this wow. and um so they was clearly opening themselves up and also us now my mum went on to do tarot card reading and palm reading and stuff she'd become a very serious drinker and in that house that we moved into, my parents split when I was about nine years, 10 years of age. And they were the couple that everybody said would never split. But God wasn't in their marriage. And there was a lot of witchcraft. Now, a lot of people that don't know God, don't know the Lord, doesn't know scripture, you know, would say, oh, witchcraft, what are you talking about? The Middle Ages here, yeah? you're talking about, you're going back to the middle. But reality is, is witchcraft, is in the world it's a very very powerful force it's demonic and unfortunately the the, the ruler of this world mm. is the devil and unless you know christ unless you're born into the into the kingdom of god unless you're a son and daughter of god then and you haven't got if you haven't got that covering which my parents never had because they then they they there's no way that they was going to survive them their, their marriage mm. and so i remember from that very early days that what was going on around me was affecting me but I could actually sense it and see it I could see into the spirit realm but I, I didn't understand it at that very young age wow. so I often you know I said in my book that you know I, that I was kind of never going to walk alone um, I wouldn't have realized that but that was the case and the demonic followed me there was a, a spirit of death that was on me from very young and my life spiraled out of control from a very young age. There was a lot of, um, my, as, because my parents split, there was, there was um, rejection there. Um, there was a spirit of fear that came in very, very young. And my mum started to drink very, very heavily. And she started to see uh, my father left. He's a very placid man, a, a man that works in the building, used to work in the building trade. Um, you know, he, they just split, he left. We still see our father, our, our biological dad, mm -hmm. but this gangster come into the home and um, he was, you know, linked to some of the most powerful 
um, gangs in the country, especially one he was linked to in South London, very notorious gang, a torture gang. And this guy had become like a, a, an uncle figure to me. Wow. Charlie, who was the best friend of the guy that was with my mum. But now the man that was with my mum, he would come, he would beat her quite a lot regular. So, of course, when you're consoling your mum at one, two o'clock in the morning, you're 10 years of age, she's very drunk, bloody, suicidal. She tried to take her life a couple of times. This all just went, we, we just sort of, our life completely turned upside down. So that was going to happen anyway because of the occult, because of the generational iniquity that was already in our lives. Okay, now what happens is Satan, when he's, he networks, so the demonic networks, and what happens is when, you're, when you've opened yourself up, when the family has opened themselves up to the demonic in that way, the enemy's then got, he's got permission, or you could call it authority, but he's certainly got permission to take you where he wants. And the home that we lived in, that we moved into when I was about seven, where all of this breakdown started, an old lady knocked our door once and she said to my, my, my grandmother was actually there visiting at the time. She said, have you ever had any luck in this house? She said, because everybody that lived here has never had any luck and they've moved on really fast. Wow. Now, I know that, that, that there was a lot of demonic uh, presence in that house. So I would suggest looking back, knowing what I know now, that there was probably a lot of, you know, satanic worship going on there. There was something heavy that had gone on in that home. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that the devil basically just led us there because he had permission to do so. Mm -hmm. So he comes to steal, kill and destroy. And that's what he was trying to do to us. And he succeeded to a tremendous degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as we know, God has a plan and, you know, we've got free will. And when he revealed himself to me, which I'll talk about later on, then, you know, I had to make that choice and run towards him. And and then all of a sudden, you know, we realise that he wants to give us justice for all of these terrible things that, that the devil does to us. Mm -hmm. And our generational lines, he wants to give us justice. But that that's a long road before you get to that point of justice, when it really starts to be given given to you in full full measure and, and wow. God really does want to give us justice for justice in a way of giving us back tenfold or what the devil stole mm -hmm. from us yeah. and he gives it in a way of anointing and blessing so yes. that we go on to bless his church mm. okay but I, I'm not going to run away too forward to <laughs> run, ahead, run ahead too soon so so that, that's where it all started that was when my eyes were opened although I didn't understand what what it was right I was very open to, to the spirit realm from, from a very young infant, original child, you know, sort of very young child. So where did all that lead you? Well, what happened was, as I say, my parents split. The guy that come was with my mum, he was very violent. And it was a love-hate relationship with him because he was, he was a very, he had a lot of charisma. I would go to the boxing events, so I'd be around other, like, you know, gangsters and, I wanted to be like them. I didn't like school, you know, and I, I wasn't academic in any way. And and so I just thought, well, if if you can't, maybe I thought if you can't beat them, join them. So I thought, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be anything in this world, I'm I'm gonna be that kind of person. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I always wanted to be a man that that had, um, you know, that was that was a fair fair. But if you cross me, then I'll do that. And it's kind of like I was sort of just fabricating this idea of what I was going to be. And I ended up leaving school, coming away from school very young, 15 I actually left. Oh, of course, I went through the ranks of petty f f thief to, because although I was linked to these older guys, I was still out with my mates doing things. And so I'd be out stealing cars and, and you know, robbing houses and stuff like that and taking drugs very very young 13 14 wow and drinking i remember and the depression came in that young i remember sitting i always looked a little bit older mm -hmm. so i was sitting in a house in a pub public house in, in a, a boozer as we call them over here and um i remember sitting there on my own at 15 with a double whiskey and a, and a pint of lager uh 
with depressed, with tears running down my cheeks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so very young, and there, you know, and I, you know, I was, I was, you know, sleeping with prostitutes and things like that, and and I just really, that's it. Satan just had his had his hand around me throat and was just leading me. Wow, at such a young age. And you yeah. were like 14 years old then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I left school 15. So I carried on like that. I was just out stealing cars and burglaries and robberies and things like this. So I went to jail when I was 19 for, for robberies, um, housebreaking. Uh, and I came out. And then I, the guy that was with my mum, he said to me, come to work with me. So they knew that I had been to jail and obviously didn't put anyone in it. Not that it was anything to do with them, but I, as far as that whole sort of, you know, underworld type of thing goes, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, uh, spill the beans. I didn't say anything. I didn't, uh, you know, um, you know, put anyone in it. So it was like, well, he's, he's okay. So come to work with us. And I started to earn big money. You know, it was drugs. And um, at the age of sort of 20, 21, sometimes 30,000 30, pounds in one day, that's like 40, 50,000 dollars. Wow. So, um, so now I'm, I'm going to nightclubs and I'm, I'm you, know, you know, all of that VIP stuff and I'm a young kid. But all the time I was disguising the, 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 the frightened child that was inside. I had a broken spirit. I mean, you mentioned earlier, um, about, you know, we can only kind of take so much when you're a kid. And, and I've heard it explained this way, your spirit, we're very temperamental, you know, very sort of sensitive is the right word. And it doesn't matter whether you're a great big 25 stone wrestler or whether you're a, a, a little five foot one woman, it doesn't matter. You know, we're, we're, there's only so much you can take and the spirit is like an elastic band. And if you're stretched and stretched through trauma, especially at young, yeah. There's only a point where something's got to give and it would, like an elastic band, it would just snap. Yeah. And that's what happened to me when I was that, that young boy. I felt like I'd been abandoned, abandoned by the men that was in my life. My father, my uncle, my grandfather, my, my mum's dad. No one was sticking up for me and my sister. So at that very young age of 10, I remember saying to myself, vowing to myself, if he ever touches my sister, that's the guy that was knocking my mum about, the gangster, I would do something about it. I was only 10. But what happened at the age of 21, I'd been working with him about a year, and at the age of 21, he did. He had a go at my sister. I was away somewhere, 50, 60, 70 miles away on some business, and I got the call, and I, and, and I don't want to go into that and glorify that, but he ended up on a life support machine, and, um, but he did pull through. Now, what happened then is I had all of his contacts. I was up very well known in the underworld thing. So if I can do it to him, I can do it to anyone. So that kind of boosted my reputation. Well, I love that to a degree. I'm a young man. I was ambitious. And and the only way I thought I was going to succeed in life was through living that kind of life. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, filled me with even more pride and deception. And, And then so now I'm taking all sorts of risks, you know, and, um, you know, and I, and I went to went to the front, but we say over here, you know, if someone's gone to the front, it's like they've gone straight to the front of the queue and they've done well for themselves in that way, in that kind of thing that they're doing. So, but it was all just a lie and, you know, it didn't matter how much money I had, you know, didn't matter how flash the cars were or whatever. It was just a mask. We've heard this explained in the same way from many different people and testimonies. I was wearing one mask on top of the other one and no one would have ever known that I suffered with fear, but I was. I just felt I was very good at turning the fear into a, into a um, you know, a weapon against right. the world. And I used that fear and I was very, very good at disguising the little frightened boy Mm -hmm. that had broken off. When I talk about that that little bit of the spirit, it's like a little part of me had broken off and I'd thrown him over the back of the the sofa away from, I'd hid him, but he was still there and he still had his little voice, but he was frightened. And I had a tremendous healing 
that come from this two years ago in a, in a healing and deliverance ministry and Jesus healed me profoundly and I didn't even know that that little boy had a voice and he was so the fear that would come up in me it was that little boy that was saying oh no we we can't do this we can't do this you know I can't handle I can't take this I can't do we don't take us into that situation but when Jesus revealed him to me and revealed that truth it was a very very emotional three hour ministry session and I was in bits you know I'm I'm 100 percent you know a, a man you know but I, I, there's nothing wrong with accepting and and crying there's nothing wrong nothing wrong with a man showing his emotions especially when jesus is saying child i'm healing you amen bring, bring this little boy back in i want you to re, i want you to say sorry to to for for pushing him away right right bringing him back in and and that's what happened i brought that little boy back in because I was saved, but there was a little part of me that didn't know Jesus. And that was that little boy that I was press, pushing away all That's the right. time. Yeah. Uh, I was hiding him because I was putting all my fear on him. No, I don't want anything to do with you or the fear that, that, you're, that, that links me to you. So I was really living that lie. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when I come to Christ, there was still a part, that little part of me was still screaming out and didn't, you know, I was kind of rejecting him still. So Jesus wanted him, he wanted all of me to be with him. Yeah. Okay. And that's what happened. And it was a tremendous healing that took place. And I thank God, I thank Jesus all the time because he healed me in a way that I didn't know I needed healing. Wow. That's how much he loves us. You know, that's so true. And I've often said this to people that, you know, when we give our lives to the Lord, it's a journey of healing. Because salvation is more than, hey, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we're so excited that it is, but it, it, it involves um, healing and deliverance. Mm -hmm. And as we're renewing our mind and as we are getting to know the Lord even more and we're intimate with him, he peels back the layers of our heart and he heals us piece by piece and layer by layer. And he puts the broken pieces of our life back together. And I believe like the more you walk with him and the older we get, the longer we walk with walked with him, things will begin to surface in our life. And for you, it was that little boy. He just began to surface and the Lord says, Hey, I'm going to go there. I want him. And then you brought him back up and God did that great healing. It was just probably four or five years ago, the Lord, he did the same thing in me, that little girl that felt abandoned, you know, I'm going to bring her back up and I'm going to heal her completely. And I'm going to heal you. And it was a, when God does it, he breaks the hold of that spirit over you also like mm -hmm. abandonment was my issue. And maybe there's someone out there that's listening and they're older and they've been walking with the Lord and God's been peeling those layers, you know, back little by little. And you've maybe been asking the question, what is that? What am I doing wrong? No, that's God healing you. That's God getting to the very core of your being. He loves you that much that he wants you to be healed inside and out. And that's his love for us. That's the anointing that's that's what he does he breaks chains he yeah. heals our life he heals our brokenness if we would just stay if we just keep walking with him and that's what you did when you had that revelation of him you just kept walking with him and you know i i know a lot of the middle of your story too so i know there was a lot of demonic activity that started coming about in your life so when about did you start experiencing really wrestling with the enemy yeah i mean well as, as i said I, I struggled with the fear all my life um for two decades i was involved with serious crime mm -hmm. and i was i'm 50 now so i was probably 41 i was i I'd been in and out of relationships all my life different relationships i couldn't hold down a relationship because I didn't, I didn't have any real idea of who I really was. I mean, I've created this identity that worked for me to, to a degree, but only in worldly terms. You know, on the outside, people would have said, oh, he's a success story, drives lovely cars, he's got a, 
or he's got a good looking woman or whatever and you know all of the trappings of money gold watches and things all of that rubbish right and, and but it's just shallow rubbish but that was the identity and you just you can only live that life for so long and then all of a sudden you'll just start to break down and because you can only hold up that mask for so long so that started the breaking down started to happen when I was eventually I got married I wanted to make it right in my late 30s and um, so I two I got four daughters by two children with the woman that I married um, and um, but that didn't last again because you you can't you can't make you know when there's too much wounding in there and on both parties as well you know when there's wounding on both sides you know if, if Jesus is not in the marriage if, if there's no healing there you know if there's no if the Holy Spirit's not involved and you've got two wounded people that have come together it's a recipe for disaster so it, it doesn't work it doesn't it don't, didn't work for me and um, you know so so that what happened um, so I Basically, I probably got to about 41. I was uh, separated and I was just burnt out. I was I was kind of, I've lost my nerve to a degree. I didn't want to take the chances to, to keep earning the same amount of money. You know, I mean, I would take risks and every time I went to purchase certain things, you know, coke and that, you know, by the kilos, you know, you, you're turning walking into situations where you could get 10 to 15 years right or you could get robbed or you could get shot or something you know i mean you, you've got to have that animal instinct to live in that world to, to survive in that sphere and i was losing my nerve because i was breaking down I, I couldn't survive in that situation i couldn't you know i was struggling to to i didn't know who i was it was like well what's going on i knew i i've been a bad guy i was knew I'm, I was looking for redemption yeah. I was looking for healing I was looking for, for, for I knew that inside of me there was a, a person screaming to be something different mm. and I always thought deep down that I would become come right in some way but I had no clue I could never I would have never have said to you in a million years it would have been the way that it came through the knowledge of God and, re and, and, the, and the salvation through Christ. I just didn't understand any of that, that God is a living God and he really, you know, is real. You know, it was, yeah. I didn't have any idea of it whatsoever. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, it can only be the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. And so I got to the age of 41. I was now busted and I was trying to drink myself to death in a trailer on my own. In a, in a coastal place um, on the south of England. And I bought this trailer because I just didn't even have the energy to want to go and buy, you know, buy a flat or something at an apartment and then furnish it out. I just wanted to buy something that already had wardrobes and furniture. I just wanted to hang my clothes and sit down and drink. And that's what I've done. And I, this happened for many months and, and I just got very, very sick. You know, it's very, very difficult to take and so I was kind of suicidal but not taking tablets to do it in one go I was just passively trying to finish it right and of course with that the drugs I was always took a lot of drugs cocaine and amphetamines and also like crack towards the end I was smoking crack and um what happened was um I got to the point where obviously there's 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 pornography you're on the laptop you're watching you know you're you're lonely, you know, you're desperate, you're trying for an expression, you're trying to connect with, and it's and it's just all a lie, the devil's just putting one thing in front of you and trying to destroy you. Yeah. And, and I got to a point where I was seeing in that trailer, and this went on for weeks, I was seeing dark spirits, they were spirits flying around me fast, all around my body and all around the ceiling and coming back around me, and it was... You know, when I was in that, oh, once I come to Christ, the, one of the ministers, the guys in there, one of the brothers said that it was, they would be believed they were spirits of death. Mm. So anyway, I started to see this stuff and I believed that something entered me. Well, I don't believe I know something entered me one night. And the next day, or, well, you know, when the sun came up, I realised that something had broken. And I've often called it in a way of, you know, it's almost like a head gasket's gone on a car. 
You know, the water's running into the oil, something's desperate, you're going to seize up. And that's what happened. I started to seize up. I knew that it wasn't drugs. The drugs had led me to that point. The witchcraft, the rebellion through drugs had led me to that point. And all of the, you know, ancestral generational iniquity that I now know is the truth, but led me to that point. But I was totally blind to that. And what happened is once I, something entered me, I realised once I started to sober up, because it did make me sober up, because I was seeing things, I was hearing demonic voices down the phone, the cell phone. I was seeing demons. I was just really in a bad place now. It was like I'd gone from bad to worse. And I realised I needed something serious. I needed some healing, some serious healing. And still, obviously, had no clue the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth, you know, in Jesus Christ and what he, the truth of the gospel. And a friend of mine, bless him, he was trying to help me. He said, he said to me, if you go to Peru, there's a potion you can drink out there with tribes called ayahuasca. So I learned about, I found out about it. I managed to get myself together. And within two weeks, I flew, was now, I flew into Peru, into Lima, the capital, and then flew into the, the town of Iquitos. And that's right in the center, in the jungle of the, uh, the Peruvian Amazon part of the jungle there. Um, and I was there for quite a long time. But yeah, it was there that I started to go into ceremonies. Um, I ended up with a party that got onto a boat and we went four hours down the Amazon River and stayed with a Shipibo tribe for two weeks. And it was there that I started to see, I'd already take, done one ceremony um, before, that was when I first got to Iquitos. So what, but, what kind of ceremony was it? Well, it was these ayahuasca ceremonies. Basically, it's it, there's a, a shaman, uh, witch doctors, shamans, mm. and um, these potions. You take this potion; it's psychedelic, but basically, what you know, you're under the the, the curse of that witch doctor. You know, whatever he's spoken over the, yeah. as they as they're um, boiling this stuff up. You know, they spend hours speaking stuff over it. So you're totally in the realm of, of the demonic. And um, so you take the potion. It takes about 20 minutes to start to work. And then, you know, you are, you're seeing psychedelic stuff. But it's very spiritual. It's not, you know, I've taken acid in the past and stuff like that. It wasn't that. This was, this was, the, this was demonic. It was spiritual. It was, it was taking you other take into the demonic realms i was seeing things that you wouldn't want anyone to see a ma manifestation of a demon coming out of a man this is when i went to the jungle four hours with this uh, about 14 15 other people to this shipibo tribe and uh, in the center hut there in the ceremony hut you know i was seeing this a demon coming out of this guy and it went on for hours and i was it was wrestling with me because it was aligning with the the darkness that was inside of me. Right. And I it was coming in down through my throat. I mean, this guy, this thing was coming out of this guy about a metre, three feet or so above his head. And I could see clearly what it looked like. You know, I, it's horrible to talk about this stuff, but you know, it was um, you know, it was it was very it just looked like thousands of years old and it was horrible things it was screaming out and making like clicking sounds and almost like um like jurassic type noises you you know that kind of thing you know it had a big like round head and flat nose and eyes with slits and but it was coming out of this guy and it and then it would go and the guy was sitting there with his legs crossed and his head down and then as it went back into him then his head would come up and he would start to say and scream the same stuff so it was the demon was speaking through him well, it was attacking me. I was rolling around, holding my throat, and I was, you know, sort of crying out, you're, I'm not evil, you're not coming into me. And it was kind of ironic that I was saying that because I'd been very, very evil in my life. I'd done a lot of evil things. I'd gone out with murder in my heart a lot. Um, and I'd, I'd done a lot of, you know, there was a lot of violence in my life. And there was, you know, I'd put a lot of drugs out and, and ruined a lot of people, you know. 
I had a lot to repent of. There was a lot of darkness in me, and, of course, it was aligning with me, mm. okay? So I've battled with this thing all night for hours and hours until the sun come up, and then it all just sort of began to go away. And But there was, during that ceremony, there was grown men and women that were screaming, grown men screaming for their lives. You know, it wasn't just me. There was people there that was... And the shamans were trying to keep them in the hut, you know, and trying to turn them away from the threat. But they was out of their depth. They couldn't handle the situation that they had. So, you know, the next day I said to one of the shamans, you know, you know, you should take this guy. There was a tree there that they took us to. They called it the sacred tree. I don't know. It's a very, very old tree, big, wide thing hundreds and hundreds of years old and they sort of worship this tree and and in my naivety I said you should take him this guy I've called him Tom in my book you should take him to the tree and and get that out of him well of course I didn't know understand that only the Holy Spirit can expel that demon right. so you know that wasn't going to happen so what happened is after that first that night there I was no way I was going to go in for any more I realized that this was just getting from you know, I was in a just terrible, terrible situation. And when was it going to end? And um, I tried to talk other people going because they were doing these ceremonies every two nights. So I would try to speak to other people and tell them not to go in. You don't have to go in. And then the second, so the second night as they went to go back in, I started to feel it again. I hadn't taken anything else, but... They went into the ceremony hut and I was in a smaller hut of my own, a few yards away, maybe 30, 40, 50 yards away, I don't know, and um, in a hammock. And then it all started again and I was just waiting, hoping that this thing wasn't going to start to manifest again out of this guy, Tom. And sure enough, it did. And that was it. And I just got on my knees and I was frightened. I was at that point. I was in hell. And I was kind of... So, you know, I hadn't took any more, but I still had it in my system and I was vomiting because it makes you vomit anyway, ayahuasca. But I was just vomiting through fear and trauma of it all, really. Wow. And I was on my knees and I was just, I cried. And the thing is, I went back to always say it in this way, I went back to like a default mode. Now, I went to Sunday school two or three times maximum. My mum took me. They dropped me off, and that was. I used to remember I went for the chocolate, they used to give you chocolate at the end when you walk back through the doors, right? right? So I remember going just for that. Well, that was the only that in our schools back then you did have assembly in the morning, and, and so that you would have the headmaster would say a prayer at the end. So there was the Bible was in the school, but it, and it wasn't really preached thoroughly. But I guess you know that was still the word had gone in, maybe you know, and um. I sort of found myself in, on my knees in that shed, in that in that uh, cabin on my own, um, saying, Jesus, if you're real, please help me. I'm scared and please help these other people. I was actually interceding for them as well, in a way. I would call it interceding Wow. now, but I was just praying, Jesus, please help us and yeah. you know, please, um, please protect us from the evil that's in this camp. Yeah. And so I found myself like getting through that night with my crying, with my head in my, into my hands, just just praying to Jesus for protection because I had nowhere to go. All I had was where I was sitting and that was it. And, and what I was doing with my mind, which was focusing it on prayer. And yeah. I'd never been a man of prayer. You know, I might have said prayers when I was a kid. You know, then prayers from the assembly hall might have, followed me back home because I was very frightened at times when I lived at home because I knew there was entities. I'll say I believed, well, I knew that there were spirits in the house and, and I knew that there was darkness in the house. So at times I think I did, well, I know I did pray as a kid, now and again, asking Jesus to protect me. So I don't know where that faith comes with. It comes from God, obviously the faith but I never come from a Christian family but there was times through fear when I was a child I did I did pray well anyway I went back to that default mode and I felt protected when I prayed to Jesus for protection I felt I did feel protection hey you guys you've been listening to part one 
of Tony Mazzi's story. I'm telling you, his story is so powerful. And even while we were in the interview, I just felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to encourage you. You know, the Word of God says that we don't fight battles like the world fights them. And maybe some of you have been trying to fight your own battles and you've been you've been trying to take matters in your own hands and you're feeling the spiritual warfare. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Listen, your war is different from the world. The world will fight with their tongue using lies to manipulate, cheat, steal, and control your emotions. The one thing that has been attacked since the pandemic is our emotions. The enemy will use emotions to control you, and I want to tell you, don't let the enemy do that. I want to speak into someone's life. James 4 and 7 says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the Bible also says in Ephesians 6 and 11 to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, you will stand. Listen, you guys, you need to fight the good fight of faith in realizing this war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, rulers of darkness. And I want to encourage you, stay in prayer. Stay on your knees. I don't look for things to get better anytime soon with this pandemic and all that's going on. I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And things may not get better around you, but things can get better inside of you. So I want to pray right now over your heart, over your soul, and over your mind. Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I plead the blood of Jesus over every person that is listening. I thank you, Father, that you are with them and that you are helping them. And in times of trouble, we can call upon you. I thank you, Lord, that the battle doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to you. You are fighting the battle for us. And the only battle that we have to fight is to keep our faith, to stay in your presence. So I pray, Father, that every person that's listening that they would be drawn into your presence, drawn into your power and to stay in your keeping power and to stay in your faith and to keep on believing. There is warfare against somebody's mind right now. There's depression, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's demonic activity all around them and there's sickness. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, your word says that you come to destroy the plans of the enemy. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, and I plead the blood over them right now, that you would destroy every plan that the enemy has had against your sons and your daughters. But Lord, your word also says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that you know the plans that you have for us. You have designs over our life and you have good things. You want to give us a hope and a future. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe upon every person that is listening right now. And under the sound of my voice, God, that they would feel your power, feel your presence come upon them. That they would know, God, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And with you, Lord, we can overcome anything. That depression has to bow at the name of Jesus.
I thank you, Father, that anxiety has to bow at the name of Jesus. And fear has to bow at the name of Jesus. And you have the name above every other name. Your name is above cancer. Your, your name is above every disease, Father. And we take into captivity every thought and negative thought that the enemy is trying to bring against us from reports or negative reports or and how the enemy loves to paint a picture for us. But God, I pray that faith will paint a bigger picture and that you, God, would draw your people unto yourself and that you would show them what you are capable of doing. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for keeping them and for protecting them. And Lord, your word says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper in Jesus' name. Lord, you you didn't say that the weapon would never form, but you did say that it would not prosper. So I thank you right now in Jesus' name that this weapon that the enemy is using against your sons and daughters will not prosper. But we have been made overcomers through the blood of Jesus and through the word of our testimony. And I thank you, God, for Tony Mazzi and the word of his testimony. And through what you have done in his life, what you did for him, you will do for others also. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to seal this prayer in the most powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us with part one of Tony Mazzi's story. And I hope you tune in for next week for part two. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may you remember, keep the faith and keep holding on. Don't ever lose hope in Jesus name. Amen. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to One Voice Makes a Difference. It is our prayer that through this episode, God has given you a new hope and inspiration to come out of darkness, break the silence, and tell somebody so His light and healing power may begin working in you. If you would like to connect with Janet, visit her website at janetswanson.org. Finally, if you are currently in crisis, please call the 24-7 Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Don't hesitate. Your voice and your life matters.